Jukebox and Cal OS. How are you? We're here with my guest, Mike O'Malley. How are you, Mike? Jonesy, great to be here. Long time listener and oh, big time fan. No, it's really great to be here with you. We're happy to be here listening to songs and chatting. Thank you. You've already uh, Spotify. I mean, uh, Shazam. Shazam, the couple of tracks. Yeah, I Shazam that paralyzed by RPG. Yeah. Where, where are they from? I have no idea. <laughs> I think they're from Boston. <laughs> All right, they're from Boston. Huh? Hey, All right. Mikey, hey, hey. Yeah. hey, you're just playing some Boston. And, and, uh, it's interesting bands that name themselves after towns and places. And Who else is uh, Asia? <laughs> <laughs> they, name them, <laughs> they name themselves after a continent. <laughs> they're just like Asia. Asia. Who is in Asia? They were big back in the early 80s. I'm old, so I remember them. But. I actually don't know one name of someone in Asia. Do you know an Anyone? Of a person? Yeah, who was a, you know, a singer, guitarist? Oh. oh, I thought you meant someone actually living in Asia. Carl Palmer. Who's Carl Palmer? Oh, from Emerson Lake and Palmer? Right. Oh, he was in there. There you go. All right, yeah. Asia, okay, Asia. Asia, Boston. I don't know. I don't know. Nashville, that was a movie. I don't know any other place. Oh, Chicago, of course. Okay, Chicago. Chicago. Uh, How many members were in Chicago? 25, I think. <laughs> every every horn that was ever invented, <laughs> it was a guy who's like, okay, we need a guy, we need a guy who plays a bassoon, and his mother's like, you're not going to be in a rock band. Yes, I am, Chicago. I'm going to start a rock band. I saw, I saw a documentary on them recently about them guys. They had quite the, quite the life, them guys, in the day. Was you a fan? Partying? Yeah, pa they were partying? Partying. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm a fan in terms of... No, I guess because fan means are you a fanatic. No, I am someone on the radio who listened to a radio in the car who oftentimes when hitting the seek button, if it stopped on a Chicago song, I wouldn't necessarily turn it. Yeah, yeah. But then he went off and started singing songs with Cher, Peter Cetera. Yeah, he went soft, didn't he? Well, I think he went rich. Rich and soft <laughs> and flaccid. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't anywhere near him, so I don't know about either of those things. And I, I didn't come on the radio and start dogging Peter Cetera, but he's well, obviously not, a big success. Well, we're not dogging him. He, he, he went, it went all soft, though. The music, it was very, like poppy, total he, pop. Yeah, I think he was just, uh, it was, yeah, he was, he wanted to probably compose a couple songs that uh, kids could dance to, slow dance to, yeah. at the uh, prom. I think he wanted to be famous. Well, he is. <laughs> <laughs> he has a documentary about him. I mean, well, it's about the whole band, but yeah. <laughs> they actually catchy songs. <laughs> What's that one about uh, in the park? Uh, That's Big Chicago. Kid. Yeah. What's interesting is he doesn't remember in that song what the date was. He says, I think Fourth it was the 4th of July. Yeah. I know, but he says, I think. I think that uh, most 4th of Julys I remember. So it's if, probably the 4th or the 5th or the 6th. If, it, if it's close to that. This is probably before he was soft. He was probably doing a lot of drugs back in those days and doesn't remember. So that's why he has to sing, I think it was the 4th of July. Like, I'm, I remember most 4th of July parties and parks that I'm in. Or maybe it was Memorial Day. <laughs> a similar part, like kind of hot, fake holiday. Yeah, but Memorial Day, you're honoring deceased veterans. 4th of July, you're just partying. But what's the holiday for, 4th of July? It's for independence. It's for the independence. The, the Where you kick the Irish out of a... Uh... It wasn't the Irish. Most of the Irish came here. <laughs> the Irish came. The Irish were not... I don't think they were colonizers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of the Irish were colonizers. So, we're, so too busy partying and creating music. Are you are you full on Irish? I'm a hundred percent all the way back. Yes, the you got to be with that DNA name. <laughs> with that name. You got to be with the. And my mother was McGuire, and uh, yes, with this face, I have the kind of face which you eat eat three pieces uh, pieces of bread. I look like the Michelin Man. So I got. <laughs> <laughs> Potatoes, uh, yeah, beer, uh, Guinness, uh, bread. Uh, it, it only enhances the Irish features. Yeah, do you know the uh, them, when I first came to New York, the Balani Stones? Yeah, sure. It was it was on uh, on Tenth, right? There was a few of them. I think. Oh, <laughs> right, there was. Yes, actually, we had a we had a big party at one of the Blarney Stones over in Hell's Kitchen, um, which is you know forty about forty sixth and tenth. Yeah. But there was many of them. There was a few, I think. Yeah. Midtown, though. Yes, Midtown. Remember right. the Uruguay Hotel? I don't. It was a rock and roll hotel. Okay. Everyone used to stay there. 
I think there was one close to that because I remember walking out of there, didn't know where I was going, <laughs> and went into one of the places because I thought it was a pub. Yeah. Well, they are pubs. Right. There are, and there's. And what was interesting about New York pubs is that you didn't necessarily have to have any food there. So literally you could just have snugs and little places where people just, yeah, we're just here to do one thing, drink, yeah. get hammered, and, uh, and go home. Yeah. Uh, they don't have too many of those anymore. So um, <clears throat> why did a lot of Irish end up in Boston? Was there a reason? Uh, and I New York, right? I think a lot of Irish ended up in Boston. It's interesting that you're asking me about that because I'm actually – uh, reading a book about it right now about the Irish in America and part of it was because it was the first uh, you know it was the closest port so they'd come over and they'd stop in Boston it, a lot of them stopped in Canada and Newfoundland um, but but that's one of the reasons and, um, and it was very difficult for them at first because they were you know looked upon as uh, cultists and you know people who uh, you know praying to the Virgin Mary and so forth this is great rock and roll radio. Thanks it for is, man. Guys. This is the no, real stuff. Um, but but when they when they when they first come, was it like go to America and start a new life? Was it when, when they was trying to get people into America? I think it was part of it, but it was also it was you know Boston was a very um, they call them Boston Brahmins back then, and, and mostly in the late eighteen hundreds, uh, you know it was there was not a lot of Catholics there, and so I think that you know people came, and one of the reasons I think the Irish is it's saying this in this book is one of the reasons that they became so um, successful in America was because they spoke English, they understood, you know, they were one of the few immigrant classes that came here and knew the language so they could read the Constitution, they could read the laws, they could argue, they could fight, they could persuade, they could, um, you know, they could rally their people uh, to vote for them in office so yeah. they could start to have influence. And okay. that was really, you know, turn of the century, 19th century. As opposed to Italians who couldn't speak English. Well, I, I just think it was an additional obstacle for other immigrant classes that, that did not, or groups, I should say, not classes, but, but that other groups had to figure out that the Irish already had figured out, you know, centuries prior. Yeah. When I say figured out, I mean have a language forced upon them that was not their own. The American language. No, the English language. <laughs> They have their own language, Gaelic. Yeah, but it's completely different than uh, the lime is. American English is mm -hmm. totally different than, than uh, English English. Yeah, I guess there's, there's many words that are different. I don't know. I'm not a linguist. I'm just an actor. But that was one of the things I loved about America, that you, underst you understood the language. Right. Until I got here and I asked for a packet of Marlboro <laughs> cigarettes to this guy in the shop. I said, a packet of Marlboro. He's like, what? <laughs> what? It, what? This literally went on for five minutes until I had to go around the counter and grab him. What was it? What When you <clears> started <throat> to spend more time here and you'd go back and hang out with your friends uh, back in England, what was, what was the one, what was the word they'd make fun of you for saying? Oh, man. I mean, there were so many. My accent has changed a lot since I've been here 35 years. But prior to coming here, you know, I guess it was strong. Because when I speak to people back home, they think I'm American. Yeah, they think you're like a hippie. Right? Yeah. Look at you, dude. Yeah, look you're at you. You're talking so slow. You think you're all slick living in America. <laughs> and I'm here in soot. <laughs> right. Groveling over gruel. Yes. You know. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I love, the st I love the States. I think it's the best place on the earth. Yeah. Still. You know, still the best place. What do you miss the most about home? Because I miss the East Coast. I miss uh, seeing friends and family to the degree, you know, because I've lived out here in Los Angeles for about 20 years, but I grew up in New Hampshire and Boston. And uh, that's the hardest thing for me is is now as, as I'm getting older, going back and seeing people. You know, it's like when you see your uh, older friends and now, like I said, I'm, I'm 51. I see a friend and I was like, wow, he's, he got old. And I'm thinking, then I get sad because I'm thinking, oh, my God, he's looking at me saying, oh, my God, you got old. I think you look healthy living in LA. I think you have a better lifestyle than a lot of places. Yeah. Like when I see people back home, pictures of them, we're the same age. They they look kind of bit knackered. Ancient. You know? A bit bit knackered. It's a different lifestyle in 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 England. Unless you've got tons of bread, if you're just kind of working class or one up from working class, it's a, it's hard. Right. 
It's hard, and it's very expensive there now. And yeah. if you live in a city, it's hard to exercise and do anything, right? Other than walk around, just walk for miles and miles and miles. And Los Angeles, it is pretty extraordinary if, you know, the places that are right in and around and near the city, the hikes that you can go on, yeah. you know, you can, you can stay relatively fit. I'm not the picture of fitness, but... Do you eat healthy or do you eat... I try to. I, I've tried to eat healthy more, um... You know, it's it, but it's uh, it's hard because it takes work. I was just thinking That's about true. this today. I love to eat sandwiches. Sandwiches are not really healthy. They're well, not. Well, it all depends what's I in just, them. Yeah. But bread in general. Yeah, is not, all that. Wheat and all that. Yeah. Is not that, no, that great. it's not good. I like to eat cereal. Cereal's not that good for you. I love it. Tons of sugar. Well, I mean, not. I mean, wheat. even the healthy stuff. Wheaties, I guess. Well, wheat is is not not good. But I. I'm Unless just, you're doing a commercial for them, then it's good. <laughs> Let's do a commercial for them. For Weeders, can you do your American accent, the, the, the radio voice? Uh, I'll do a radio voice. This next, uh, this next song uh, by Thin Lizzy, Vagabond of the Western World, is brought to you by Wheaties. Wheaties. Roasted bran flakes. Wonderful with milk. Use 2% or less than that if you don't want to get fat and die. Hello, you're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox of Cal OS. That was Generation X, Ready, Steady, Go. And before that was Tin Lizzy, Vagabond of a Western World. Beautiful album, that is. Um, we're here with my my new best friend, <laughs> Mike O'Malley. How are you, Mike? I'm doing great, Josie. It's great to be here. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, you picked uh, the Generation X. Why did you pick them? You know, when I was growing up in New Hampshire, and uh, my brother had a rock and roll band inspired by, of course, your band, and uh, all of this great music was coming into our house like the Sex Pistols, The Clash, Generation X, Stiff Little Fingers, The Buzzcocks. You know, all these albums were coming into our house in the you know, late 70s. And uh, my brother, you know, was uh, that's where my musical taste come, came from. I think the first two records I ever bought, the first two singles I ever bought was uh, Peg by Steely Dan and Come Sail Away by Styx. This mm. is probably 75 or 76, I think, when those songs came out. And, you know, we grew up listening to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones because my, I had an uncle who had great musical taste. But then my brother had tremendous musical taste, and he was a guitarist, and he was a great singer, he was a great songwriter. And uh, I just I just loved being exposed to music back in New Hampshire that wasn't really being played on the radio. And it was because my brother knew great record stores down in Boston. He'd go down and get these records and play them. And uh, in particular, you know, that song from Generation X was one of my favorite. I saw Billy the other day, <coughs> Sunday, and he said that um, he's trying to get that Generation X back together. Tony James, the bass player, I believe is out in now. I'm trying to reach him. I put a call in to someone who knows him, his number, but I haven't heard from him yet. But I, I believe the guitar player is not interested in, in doing it. Not interested in making uh, millions of dollars at Coachella? Well, I don't know where they would play, to be honest with you. They wasn't as popular as some bands. Yes. But still, would st I would still like to go and see it. I think that they could be, I, you know, listen, I, I think that every city in this country, uh, at least the top 10 cities, they could sell out two or three nights playing. Uh, 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 like Roseland? And I think so. Like I that. think in Boston and New York and Chicago and Minneapolis <laughs> and Los Angeles, San Francisco, all the, well, let's get together and promote this. Who do we got to call? We gotta call the guy who doesn't think these can make any money. No, no, the guy, the guy is the bass player. He is Tony James. He was yeah. the original bass player, and you got Billy, and you got the original drummer. But the guitar player is not interested in doing it for some reason. Doe, what his name is, and he lives down in Orange County, I believe. Maybe they should use me. I was gonna say you can learn these songs. Maybe they should use me. They'll put an iPad right there. Maybe the they should couple. use me. Let's put it together. Listen to me. <laughs> this is going out on the internet. You will call. 
fool me and make me play guitar with Generation X. He can learn Kiss Me Deadly in an afternoon. I can learn it all in five minutes. It's all on an iPad and it would track right in front of you and people would just think it's a music stand but it would actually be every note of every song. You'd just have to look down like Frank Sinatra used to do. I promise, Billy, I will lose 30 pounds. You won't be embarrassed of me. I promise, Billy, he will not lose the weight and you will be feeling even better about yourself when you stand next to him on stage. You're skinny and he's not. When I come <laughs> down from 10, this will happen. 10, 9, 8, 7, kiss me deadly. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So that's what I do. I hypnotize people on the air live. It's gone now. Is Billy listening? I don't know. Maybe. We could just post this to his Instagram page and then he'd listen. Someone, someone to get back to him. What you got, Shovel? This portion of Jonesy's Jukebox is brought to you by Bergner Majowski, and we have a pair of tickets to give away for Cal Jam 18. It's a big deal. KLOS and Jonesy's Jukebox welcomes Cal Jam 18 <coughs> with the Foo Fighters, Iggy Pop doing post pop depression with Josh Homme and the whole gang, Garbage, Tenacious D, Greta Van Fleet, Silver Sun Pickups, Black Mountain, and more. Billy Idol on the bill at the Whoa, Glen, Glen hey. Helen Regional Park, October 6th. Tickets on sale. Thursday at 10 a.m. There's a KLOS pre-sale that starts Wednesday at 10 a.m. And the password is KLOS. But we have a pair right now for caller 25 at 800-955-KLOS. And they're furnished by Live Nation. Oh. I don't understand. Is that is that a <laughs> fart or is that somebody going to the bathroom or is it some pornographic It's thing? a fart. It's a hog. Wow. It's a hog. I did, it's, I did it to, this morning. I was listening in the car on the yeah I heard it on that I mean it's wonderful. The best part is the ah, oh. well it's a sigh of relief. It's your you're getting waste out of you. Oh Jesus Christ! We're gonna visit the Duke when we come back. We're gonna have some more chit chats with Mike O'Malley. If if do people know you are? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Like you did, you was on Glee, right? I played Kurt's dad on Glee, but there's there's not a lot of rock listeners out there who watch a lot of Glee. <laughs> <laughs> you also you were all creator of the TV show Survivor Remorse on yeah, Stars. That, that was on Stars. I, I created that show, and I was a writer on the first four seasons of Shameless. And I was on a show called Yesteryear. But a lot of your listeners might know me from Nickelodeon Guts. Yeah, baby, come on, come on. All right, we're gonna climb the aggro crag right now, kids. All right, now listen, get back, get safe. And watch these kids live out their sports fantasies right here on Nickelodeon. Oh. <laughs> this is jukebox. Four. That was Big Star. 13 was the name of that track. And before that was the Winkies, Trust in Dick. Then we had Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. King's Road from an album Hard Promises. And then we started off with Brian Eno. It's his birthday today. And that track was called Needle in the Camel's Eye. And my guest is Mike O'Malley. Jonesy, thanks for having me here today. I hope you had fun. I had a blast. <clears throat> now, you've got something going on in, on Broadway. I actually wrote with uh, Greg Garcia, who created the show My Name is Earl. He and I took a bunch of Jimmy Buffett songs, and we spun it into an original Broadway musical. So if you're in New York, you're a Jimmy Buffett fan, you got uh, cousins, you got a, a dad, you got friends who are Jimmy Buffett fan, big Jimmy Buffett fans, they're going to like this because it's a musical uh, with 22 of his songs. And uh, what's the story, gist of the story? It's about a guy who plays guitar. He lives on an island. A girl comes down there. She's a little stressed out. He tries to relax her. Relaxer. Right, right down the middle. That's great with the relaxing. Uh, let's, uh, we got a rock block of Donny Iris and uh, Asia coming up. <laughs> <laughs> it's the heat of the moment. Uh, we're back, back in a flash. Uh, <laughs> set your VCRs tonight. <laughs> Huey Lewis, we got a new one from Huey Lewis coming out. It's, uh, it's got a new, uh, <laughs> People back in New Hampshire thought Huey Lewis was punk. Hey, yeah, it's hip to be square. It's 
Huey Lewis. Hey, I got no problem with Huey Lewis. I'm just saying it ain't punk just because somebody has spiky hair. <laughs> oh, you got some junk? I just need to say that this portion of Jonesy's Jukebox is brought to you by Volvo. Okay. I'm driving a Volvo. Oh, really? I brought my... It's, it's absolutely true. I, I brought... I was actually going to send Volvo a note. I brought my daughter home in a Volvo in 2003. I'm still driving it, and... Uh, I'm I'm hoping to have her uh, learn how to drive on the Volvo before I get rid of it. It's a good car. They're supposed to be, or they used to be. Their whole selling point was the safest car on the road. They got like 50 airbags. Yeah, as long as you're not drunk driving it, you're going to be safe. What do you think of the Elon Musk thing, the autopilot that smashed into the back of a, a, a fire station? A uh, fire uh, I'm not in the into the whole uh, auto driving thing. I don't I don't I don't I don't know how that how yeah. the hell that. Like, how that can work, but you know, he seems to be a smart guy working on a lot of stuff. He's got his fingers in <laughs> I'm, a lot. I'm of writing pies. a Jimmy Buffett musical. Yeah, I'm I'm coming here five days a week, <laughs> doing a great job All and right. bringing bringing entertainment to the people out here. We got a we got a block of Billy Squire coming up, and after that, we're gonna go at. Uh, we're going to play a band that not a lot of you know or heard much, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Uh, That's great. Thank you. Thank you. And Thursday we have Cheap Trick coming on the box. I'm looking for The forward Dream to- Police. You know, I need a dream. I need the... <laughs> I need the police to come to my dreams sometimes because I got some odd thoughts. They're suicidal and also murderous thoughts. So the dream police, please come and save me from killing my family. Ah, <laughs> oh, we're going to visit the Duke. I'll see you tomorrow.